the minute somebody would put money in my hand and you think, okay, look, and I got this wad of cash in my hand, I should be excited. I was all regretting it. I was like, ah, it's official now. I have to go do this thing because they've paid me and, you know, they've already booked me for that day and they could have booked someone else. And now they're probably not going to get the second person that they thought about because that person's probably already booked. And now I have their money and I don't even want their money and I don't even want this gig. So like starting off like that was already taking an L because I wasn't excited about doing it. I was excited about the idea of not doing my normal job. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Matt Brown, and you're listening to the Every L Podcast. Each episode, we'll have a different guest come on and talk about when life hands you an L, is it really a loss or is it something else? Because not every L's a loss. So sit back, relax, or do whatever you guys do to get comfortable as we get into this. Let's go. Hello, sir. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing really good. I'm glad to hear. So, for those of you that don't know, I have. How am I? What, what should I call you? Because you you go by your. I know your first name, but what do you want me to? Yeah, call you, you could call me by my first name. I, I that luck. Lucky Braxton is just a brand. It's a nickname that I had when I was younger, and that's just. It sounds really interesting. To well, if I say hi, my name is James. I'm like, oh, it's another James. But if I say, hey, what's up? I'm Lucky. I'm Lucky Braxton. Then people are like, whoa, like, what's your deal? What do you do? So I've, I've played around with that. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. But to be fair, given how your family situation is, you're definitely lucky, if nothing else. So hats off to you. Appreciate it. So for everyone that's listening, if you hear a little bit of a twang in his voice, it is because he is in the United States of America. Um, yeah, he's one of many that I'm going to have on here. And I'm not trying to limit it. It's just the UK. I'm trying to make it worldwide because everyone's got a story to tell. And if they're willing to jump on and talk to me so that we can share it, then I'm here for it. So James is someone I've known since 2013. We met when we was doing some online videos uh, called Vader, which is vlog every day in April or August. And ironically, it was a t- state time when I was in depression. However, he was one of the few people that kind of helped bring me out of it because he's just so creative. He's so genuine. He's absolute pleasant guy. And the energy he puts into all the stuff he does is unmatched. It, he's one of those people where you just have a good vibe with him. You catch good jokes. You know that he's pure in what he's saying. He, he is a va- fantastic role model as a father, a friend, a husband and all anything else you can think about. And I honestly thought, right, I need to talk to him and see if I can get him jump on here. The reason I didn't ask him sooner is just because I knew he had some certain stuff that he had to take care of. But I'm so happy he found the time to jump on with me and hopefully his wife won't kill me for stealing him away from us, um, from them, sorry. But yes, James, do me a huge favour and please tell the lovely folks who you are and whatever you feel comfortable divulging before we talk about your first L. I don't even think that I can match that introduction because that was, we don't even need to talk about anything else now. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, my, my name is uh, James Lucky Braxton and uh, um, I'm into video. Like Matt said, we, we met online, we met on YouTube uh, making content and uh, I've been, I've only been making content or making videos since uh, my daughter was born, which is like 11 years ago. And I've been trying to take it to a professional level and like make it a career only for probably the last, I want to say like five, maybe five or six years. And, you know, there's been some ups and downs and I've definitely taken some L's and just trying to figure out what it is that I want to do and how I want to do it because I just don't want to trade, you know, a job that I don't have passion for, don't want to do for another job that I don't have passion for and, and don't want to do so. Yeah, that's really it. I mean, in a nutshell, that's what it is. I'm a dad, a husband, a brother, and and a friend, and and I like to make videos and watch break dancing and 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 eat sandwiches. <laughs> you like to watch it because you can break dance because you're that guy. And no, uh, I used to be able to pop lock and stuff like that, but like I just I love the art. I love watching uh, b boys and b girls 
like just do that that's one of my it's it's probably it's not a guilty pleasure but it's something that i spend a lot of time watching and then i almost live through it too because i can't do that like since the knee surgery and everything like that like even trying to like mess around i can't do any of it but i love watching it because i don't watch sports <laughs> well to be fair you and i keep posting that story it's different breaking like boy like what's that about because you know, some of them are proper up there in terms of what their capabilities are. So thank you very much for the introduction. So for anyone that's new to the podcast, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, every L podcast is basically just a shortened version of Every L is Not a Loss. And as you probably aware, most of us, if not all of us, have caught an L at some point in our lives. And at the time when you're going through that L, you can't see the woods from the tree. You just think life is like that from now going forward. And sometimes we have the privilege of looking back and realizing actually it wasn't that bad, you know, or not that it wasn't that bad. This is what I took from it. So this podcast, we explore a couple of instances where people have gone through a very rough patch of their life and they want to talk about it in that what happened at the time. And then we sort of go back and sort of say, right, what was your thought process and so forth? And just sort of take away what positives we can from a situation so that those of you that are listening will have empathy will have a better sense of understanding and understand your right now is not your forever so i haven't got into it in length with james just yet but he said the first l he wanted to discuss is failed wedding videography business so sir please tell me from the top had when did you create your videography business so i think i started that i think it was like 2017 i think it was either 2016 or 2017 and i was like i got the i got the i got my camera and i had just gotten a dlsr and that was like <clears throat> excuse me that was like when the dlsr boom was like happening and for those who don't know that was like you now had access to make film like videos without having to go out and buy a $40,000 camera. Like you're part of the group now that can make those kind of videos. Yeah. So I poured everything I could into learning how to like the basics, the rule of thirds, how to frame a shot, shutter speeds, ISO, the whole kit and caboodle, like everything that you would need to, to start learning how to do video. And then I started making videos around the house and, you know, like just testing on like my creativity and then like trying to flex my creativity on top of that. And then I said, you know what, man, I'm just going to get into weddings. And the main reason I had picked weddings, because I thought that I don't really have like a film, a filmmaking background and I didn't go to school for filmmaking. So, so I, as far as like drawing out a script and, and making like narrative films, I knew that that was going to be something that was going to take longer to learn how to do. So I wanted to be more of like event, um, event capture like you know like you know almost like almost like documentary but not really because documentaries have also have a narrative but like like um like spontaneous shooting in, in events shooting events like that because it would be more like bts like i'm just capturing the day and then i try to not necessarily make a narrative out of it but just uh, have it be themed and then still make sense and have a beginning you know a middle and an end so i started doing that and i started like getting into weddings too. There was a lot of people that I knew that were getting married and I just kept putting it out there that I was like, Hey, listen, I could come out. And then my friend, Michelle, she was like one of the first people that brought me on, um, was just like, Hey, she was a wedding photographer. She's a bunch of things. Like she is like a Renaissance woman. Like she does so many different things, but, um, she was like, Hey, I'm shooting this wedding. Um, do you, uh, would you want to, uh, tag along. I know you said you wanted to get your feet wet. So for this one, I didn't really like charge anything because I wanted to experience what it would be like. So I went and I did it and it was a really good experience too. I mean, it was a, it was a pretty big wedding. There was probably like 150 people there and, you know, I dressed all in black and everything like that. And I, you know, and I enjoyed that part of it, like being at the wedding and filming all the happiness and the laughter and all that stuff. Like I really, really enjoy that. And like being around that energy all night too. It's a long day. Cause you start from like seven in the morning, six, seven in the morning when the brides are you know, putting their makeup on and everything and getting ready. And then you stick with them until like 11 o'clock at night. So when you say you start at that time, 
you technically have start, started before then because you got to get to the venue. Yeah, because you, be, you have to be there. Like, usually you want to be – I try to get there early. I try to get there, like, because I don't want to, like, the car could break down. I could have the wrong address. I could hit the button and go to the wrong place. Like, and I'm so worried about that. Like, I'll go there the day before and check it out and find where the best parking might be and be like, okay, this is a 10 minute walk from here. So I'll park over this way, like that sort of thing. Cause you know, the last thing you want to do, especially when somebody's spending that kind of money on you, like you want to show up and be professional. So, um, so yeah, so that's sort of like, that's sort of like when you start that early in the morning, especially if it's like a location wedding. So like I'm in Connecticut in the United States, so I'm in Connecticut and then Connecticut is a pretty big state. So if I'm going to be at a wedding that's two hours away, then, and I have to be there at seven, then I'm getting up at like four, you know what I mean? So that I can be there on time with all my gear, setting up all my gear and then loading my car up at night. So all I got to do is wake up, make a coffee, get dressed and then go, you know? And, and like I said, it's a pretty long day because you're running around all day. And the whole time you're running around with the camera, the only thing you're thinking is making sure that you're not missing the shot and covering the bride because you are just basically capturing their day and telling the story because that's the other thing with it too. Like, even though it's not narrative work, it's like a big stage and everyone, the stage has been set for you. And it's like, everyone has a part to play in the wedding right so you know pretty much like what you're going to do and where you're going to be and where you need to be and then uh especially like talking to like the other vendors and stuff too because you wouldn't think it but like vendors don't usually get along in weddings behind the scenes like they just they don't uh djs are pretty hard to deal with sometimes the other photographer is hard to deal with sometimes like you see that kind of stuff but it's in the it's behind the scenes um but yeah, it's a really long day. And then the venue usually ends at like 11 o'clock. And you, sometimes they'll go longer, I guess, if they paid a certain amount of money. But so like I said, that's a long, that's a long ass day from seven in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. And then like, like I said, if I'm two hours away, now I'm driving home from 11 o'clock back to the house because I don't want to, I don't want to get a hotel. I don't want to. The other thing I don't do either is I don't eat at the wedding. I eat, but I bring my own lunch. I bring my own thing to eat. I don't eat the plate because what if there's something in there that will mess with my stomach? Now you're running around with the bubble guts all night trying to get your shots. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like I bring I bring my own stuff to eat because I know my system. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> You'd have to rely on your stabilization while you're just sort of bouncing around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I got to go to the bathroom. But, you know, and then that's like a whole thing, too. Like if you can't go to the bathroom in a public place. And so like so that like there's all those different things that you got to think of, like before the wedding. And I, I was up for it. I really enjoyed doing all of that stuff, too. And then like just the learning process of like how how brides act and, and how um how the groom usually is just in a fog the entire day. <laughs> you know, it's anything you have a question for him. He's like, I don't know. Ask her, like, go, go find Smart her and ask her. Smart <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much, that's pretty much why I pr- picked weddings because it's like, I said, it's a big event that's pretty much set in place for you um, to, all you're doing is just reacting to that day and trying to capture that day without having to figure out or write a script on how the day is going to play out. And then you flex your creativity towards the end of it when you make like the actual film. So I don't, I don't do like, so like you don't want to end up with a 45 minute wedding video, which is how I was editing them at first. So they were taking really long. So I would give someone a half an hour tape with a 15 minute highlight reel in the beginning of it and really what they what they're watching is the 15 minute highlight reel and they're not watching the rest of the footage so then that's when it became wedding films so now i know that i can capture all that stuff and say okay here's my price for a two to three minute video here's my price for a five to 15 minute video and here's my price for a half an hour video and most likely they'll go for the five to 12 minute video because it's a film that captures the whole day because that's all they're going to watch anyway yeah no, that's fair enough. Um, okay, so just to clarify, so why are you doing that as a job? Well, actually, was it your job or was it a side hustle? It was like a side hustle, but there wasn't enough to replace my income because they weren't pouring in like that. They, um, I would get them every every now and again, and I also wasn't charging right either because I was desperate 
because I wanted it so bad that I was under, like I was basically cutting my own throat. So I was, I was taking on these projects and you know what it's like because you you've been on event shooting before so you yeah. you, you know what it's like to be out there it's grueling you know what i mean For, yeah. it's a long day you're carrying your equipment all day i mean you signed up for it so you 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 can't really you can complain because you still can but it's a it's a long it's just a long day uh, you've shot what you've shot a couple weddings too haven't you yeah i have actually yeah yeah it, it, it's, it's hard because ultimately you know what you're signed to when you say yes but ultimately you said yes. Right. And then you got to make sure all your gears all right. Like the batches are all charged or the other batches are recharged. And then you've got every, all your gear with you. Make sure you ain't forgotten a suitcase or this or that. And it's a lot, especially if you're doing it alone. Yeah. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. Um, and then when you have the other vendors too. So like DJs don't like when you just walk up on a DJ and say, Hey, let me plug into your mixer real quick. Like they don't like that. They don't like it at all. So what I wound up doing is I remember I used to watch a YouTuber. Um, can't even remember their names now. So it's a a guy and his wife where they were wedding videographers. And this was back when like everyone was buying the T3, the Canon T3i. Yeah. You know? So what he what he suggested doing was taking taking a um a little field recorder, not like the big I have a smaller field recorder, and then you just take that and you put that in front of the speaker. And then so when the person goes up to like you know, talk on the mic and give the speech or whatever, you don't have to hook into their mixer, which is hooked into your camera or hooked into your field recorder, because you're still going to have to, um, you know, add that that audio in later. Yeah. And even if you are going to plug in, like, if you plug in the re the 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 receiver to the transmitter on, because you can put the lav mic to the bottom of the, of the, like, tape it, like, gaff tape it onto the, to the DJ's mic, but then sometimes you might end up with feedback for that. So that's why it's just easier to just put the recorder into there. And then you have like the photographer may have had their partner was a videographer and they wanted them to be on the job. So now their partner, their friend isn't making any money. They're looking at you making money. So now they want to, you know, kind of mess with your shots or take extra long with the, you know, just to sting you, which yeah. I think is dumb too, because at the end of the day, we're all here for this couple that's shelled out all this money for us. So we should all be making the best effort to give them the best experience. You know what I mean? Instead of like doing this, this sissy shit back and forth with you stepping into my, I remember one time I got handled at a wedding um, by a photographer. Interesting. I got handled, but like, I because again, because I was so desperate to get away from my nine to five and do video, I pretty much let this photographer, he kind of like led me on the whole time. So I'm at this wedding and he was like, oh man, you, you know, you seem like, Oh you, oh, you shoot Canon too? And he was just like basically fluffing me all day. And then he was just like, you know, I think I could bring you on. You could work for me, you know, and all this other stuff. And I'm calling my wife and I'm like, yo, listen, this dude is saying that I could probably work for his firm. And basically all he was doing was like fluffing me up so that he could take most of the shots, which I learned a valuable lesson for that because then I was just like, no, 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 no. I need the, I need the couple. I have to get this shot or whatever. And he was like, I'm sorry, we don't have any time. And I was like, yeah, but you just took up all that time. And I was like, I need the couple right now. And he's like scurrying the couple off. So like, it was harder for me to edit that video because I had less shots than I should have had because I was letting this guy lead me on to think that I was going to join his, his, uh, wedding photography firm or whatever. Uh, so so that was that was a learning lesson too. That that was an L right there that I caught. So like now, like not that I I don't really shoot weddings now, but like now if I was to take on a wedding and the and the you know as soon as I hear that fluffy stuff, I'm just like nah, bro. I know what this is. I know what you're trying to do. I need my tactic. time with the yeah. I need my time with the with the with the couple as well. You know, wow! right before the pandemic, that was going to be my time. That was going to be, I was going to quit my job. I was going to go full time. I had, um, I had a couple of, of jobs that were lined up and it was looking real promising. Like that was going to be the year that I was going to take that on. And then the pandemic happened and I was just given deposits back. And then I was like, you know what? I'll just stay at my job. And then I did that. And I kind of regret doing that. Like just not, I should have just went and did it and fell on my face is what I should have did but I didn't.
but I guess it it's hard because you have a family right that depend on you to bring in income and you know I guess if we we round the time back to when we was in our 20s and like early 20s do what the hell you want mate like <laughs> it's your life your time <laughs> You burn through that disposable income like it was nothing. Now you kind of got to be more mindful of where the money's going because it's not necessarily you going without, it's your family going without. And is it their fault that it's you? I'm oh, sorry, is it their fault that, yeah, is it their fault that you haven't got the money coming in? Technically, no, it's you putting yourself in that situation. But question for you then, why did you wind it down? It was the way that I wrote my contract. So I wrote my contract was... I used to take 35% up front yeah. because then sometimes what was happening is I was making these videos. So that was like another lesson I had to learn. So I, I would get half the money up front or not half the money. I would get 35% up front. And then that was just like a number I pulled out of the air. So I went with that because it sounded good. So I would take that money up front. And then after I was done with the wedding, then it was like, okay, now you pay me on completion, right? So then once I'm done with the video, then you would pay me the money. So then there were some times where I would edit the whole video. I would spend 40 hours, 60 hours, 80 hours, you know, editing the video. And then I'd go to give it to them. And then they decided that they didn't want it. You know, they'd be like, oh, well, or they couldn't afford it. Or they went through the money that they got from the wedding or whatever, or didn't budget for that part of it. So then you end up with this really cool wedding video. And then I didn't get the other half of the money, but I did the work. So then I started, I changed the contract to be like, all right, well, I want 50% up front and I don't start editing the video until I get paid the other part of the money. And then that determines whenever you pay me, it's going to be around two weeks after that, you'll get the, the video back because that's a good turnaround time. And then it turned into, I'm, I'm going to come and shoot the wedding at the, by the end of the night, I need the second half of the check or I don't even start, I don't start editing the video. And then in the contract, I said, the only way you get your deposit back is an act of God, which means it would be like either the groom died before the wedding or I got into a I got into a, a car accident on the way in to the wedding and I couldn't be there to perform the actual, you know, the video and stuff like to get the video uh, captured. And then some people were looking at it like, well, this pandemic is kind of an act of God, you know what I'm saying? So then it was like, I was given all these, because even when they were lifting, when they had the lockdowns and they were lifting the lockdowns here, they were saying stuff like, well, weddings could happen. You can still get your wedding to happen, but you could only have 20 people there. So, so now you have to be really picky on who you're going to have at your wedding. And the brides don't want that. They want 150 people there. They want 200 people there. So I wound up giving all the money back. And then I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to lay it down. And then I was waiting. I was like, you know what? When the lockdowns stop, I was like, the wedding industry is going to explode because everyone's going to start wanting to do their weddings again. But then after all this stuff with the masks and the vaccines and all that stuff, like, so then that was into a play because that's for some reason, like, you know, it shouldn't really be like a political thing, but it was like a political stance on whether or not you wore a mask or got you know, uh, vaccinated or whatever. So your choice is your choice. But then that started to spill over into those weddings. So like the wedding industry, I guess, is still booming right now. Now it is because, you know, like you can walk around without your mask and you can walk around without um, without being vaccinated and not having a stigma, you know, on you or whatever. But so I, like it, it, it slowed down and it was already too late at that point, too, because I was like, you know what, I'll just go back to work. And then at the same time, though, I didn't really like editing videos. I didn't like making wedding videos. I didn't like spending the time all day chasing brides and stuff. like you have to have like an like an actual passion for it. And then I started thinking like the job that I have right now, I kind of I don't really like doing and I didn't want to change. I didn't want to trade trade one headache for another headache you know what i mean because i was just like i don't i'm not i don't really like doing it anyway and so do i really want to make this a career like do i really want to give up you know my job for with a with a steady income to constantly worry about whether or not i'm going to have an income to do something that i don't really like doing anyway you know what i mean so when it came to the point where you decided yeah i'm not on this anymore i'm gonna wrap it up like what was going in your mind before that? Because did you have a sense of pride where you're thinking, I put so much energy into it because I've got the gear. Like obviously you pay for this gear out of your own pocket. Um, some of it you might have got the money back, I'm assuming. 
but you've put the energy and effort into learning about shutter speeds, ISO, what camera to get, how to do low, uh, not low thirds, low thirds and stuff like that. You've put hours, time away from your family into this business. And now it's a matter of, nah. Yeah, it was kind of deflating is what it was. is because, and it definitely was like a, a punch to the ego. You know what I mean? So it was definitely that because I had put so much into it and I talked so much shit online about how, you know, uh, hustle mode. I'm out here doing this. I'm I'm making these videos. I'm getting these weddings going and my price, price went up. You know, it's a different, it's a, my price is my price. Like talking all this stuff about how I was making these videos and how I was going to do it. And then to close down the business is like, that's definitely like you're taking an L and then in a way you're kind of taking an L in the public too, because well, not in the public, but just with your peers, because, you know, you, you talked about how, well, I talked about how I was going to do all this stuff and then I didn't follow through with it. I didn't do it. So then I, I put that when I, when I closed it, when I closed the company down and I remember going to, um, city hall and filling out the paperwork to say that this company is now closed or whatever. So it did, it did kind of suck in a sense, like you, you have to go through it, but it was almost, it's bittersweet because I'm glad I did do it because I, the last thing I'd want to do, here's the thing. At that time I was working for, um, a meat delivery company. And I remember, I'll never forget this conversation I had with this, um, this one guy at this, this restaurant and, um, they took over the wife, the wife, um, mother had a, or grandmother had a business. It was like a little restaurant or whatever. And they had taken it over and they were running it for like 12 years. And I remember I came there to deliver, they made the, like the best fried chicken. It's these, um, Albanians that made the best fried chicken that I've had in a while. Like it's good. So, you know, I backed the truck up. Um, um, you know, taking their stuff and taking their food off of the off of the truck so I could put it into the kitchen for him. And I remember talking to the to the to the guy who runs it. He's the one that does all the cooking and everything. He was like the head chef there. So I was talking to him and I was like, "How long you been in the business?" And he was like, "You know, I've been in the business like you know, we took it over five year uh, five years ago, but I've been doing this for like twelve years." And um, uh, no, it was left to my wife five years ago, and we've been running it for the last twelve years or something like that. So they. Oh no, they were running it for 12 years, but they took it over the last five. That I'm sorry, that's how I meant to say it. So I was asking him and I was like, so like, do you enjoy it? Do you enjoy doing this? He was like, I love it. I get up every morning and I'm excited about what I'm going to do, what the day is going to bring. And he was like, I don't live for Fridays. Um, I live for Mondays. I wake up on Monday morning and I'm like, what new people am I going to meet? I mean, even though he's doing the same thing, he's got a different experience every day. And then he said, the day that I wake up and I'm not excited about what I do is the day that I'm going to retire. Just even saying that now, just kind of like, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it gives me like chills run through me because like he said that without even, he didn't even blink an eye. Like that's genuinely what he meant because his answer, he didn't have to think about that answer. He was basically like the day that I wake up and I don't want to do this anymore is the day that I'm going to retire or the day that I hate it because you get into some restaurants and stuff like that. And you can see like where the passion is gone and they've left it. They've completely checked out and the building is run down and the food doesn't, there's no more love that was cooked with the food. So there's no more passion for it. And then I was thinking like, I don't ever, like, I didn't even start off with that feeling with the business. Like I wasn't excited to get up and shoot somebody's wedding. It was more like I was looking at, I'm going to make, all I want to do is replace this income with that. So even though that was the feeling that I had towards it, it was still, um, it was still probably a little degrading, not degrading. I don't know the word that I want to use, but it was like, it still felt sour to close that business down after I had talked all that shit about how I was going to be the number one video business in the area you know what i mean so it still kind of stung to to close it and i can imagine and i i love i love hearing how that person shared that with you because for them it felt like they were living the answer that it wasn't just something that that they'd pre um pre-prepared for anyone else's question so do you like your job oh gosh it's amazing it's a matter of no 100 percent. that is what it is um i think 
a lot of us need to be reminded that we should enjoy what we're doing. Like living for Fridays, living for Saturdays, dreading Sundays because it's <laughs> it's the eve of Monday isn't healthy because if you're anything like me, I look at my children and I think, wow, you're amazing. I don't want to wish my life away because there's going to be a point where I'm not going to be here no more and I don't want that day to come too soon. <laughs> I don't want right. the day to come at all, if I'm honest. So then to think that my child could potentially wish away their life because they're not enjoying it, it's hurtful to me. So then why should I then wish my life away? Because then those that care about me would hate to see me wish my life away. Why should I do that? It's less time with them. Why not do the best I can because I enjoy what I'm doing? Yeah, we're all going to get that not so great part of the day that we have to do or that part of the job that we're not the most fond about. If it's like food, it's that piece of food I eat first just because it's done and out of the way and I've got a nice lasting taste in my mouth from the bits I really like enjoy on my plate. Those are the parts that I think we should focus on more in life and I, I just love that that person shared it with you because I said it already. I I think a lot of us have just forgotten the passion, the drive. Yes, money is important, but there's many multiple ways of making money and we should do it doing something we actually enjoy so that our family and friends can get the best version of us because we're enjoying what we're doing 24-7, give or take, unless you do uh, nappies. I fully appreciate you don't want to do those because that's a bit rank or potty training. Potty training, oh my gosh, it's the bane of my life right now. But it's cool, it's cool. <laughs> That's a me thing. That's that. That's 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 <laughs> that's definitely a me. <laughs> oh gosh, that slipped out. Oops. Um, <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> so for you, um, how did your wife feel when you was going through setting it up in the first instance, and then afterwards when you said to her, <sighs> "I I think she knew. I think that she knew because she." didn't like who I was when I had to actually do it. So like when I would take on a job, you would think I'd be like, yes, mm. I got this job. Um, I got this, um, I got this one gig. We're going to go, I'm going to go and shoot it. And, you know, we're going to make X amount of dollars off of it. You know what I'm saying? And like, that's what I was thinking of. And it was like, because I was charging so little, I couldn't put the money back into the business. It was like, I wasn't making a lot of money at the job that I had. And then on top of that, it was a lot of stress because it was like, she's looking at me like, okay, well, you, you, you got to help support. I'm in a blessed position too, because the house that I live in is paid off and it, it's not my house, but it's my in-laws house. And we've been here for a while. So like we have like utilities and stuff like that to pay, but there's no mortgage or no rent or anything like that. Yeah. So in a sense, I'm in a blessed position and um, I try not to complain too much because it could be the way that I grew up compared to how I live now and how my kids live. You know what I'm saying? There's really, I feel like I, I feel guilty complaining about it sometimes, you know? Because we all have that story where, like, you know, we didn't really have much younger. And now, like, you know, there wasn't a lot of food when I was younger, but now there's too much food. You know what I mean? Like, now there's so much food in the house. It's like, damn, why did we buy all this food? Because and then half of it doesn't get eaten and we're throwing out more food than I used to eat when I was younger. You know, so I'm in a really blessed position and I try not to complain. You know what I mean? But at the same time, it's like I still... I still want to be excited about the thing that I'm going to go do. I wake up every morning and I dread going to my job because I hate it. I take pride in my work and I want my work to be good because my name is attached to it. So like when somebody in the industry or a builder or cause I'm in construction uh, is my full time job. And when people come and see the work that I've done, they could be like, that's a good, like I want him back on my job site because that dude, like, you know, he kicks ass and he does a really good job at his, at his work, at his craft, but I'm not excited to do it. So like, I want to be excited about the thing that I'm going to do that morning. I don't want to wake up and be dragging ass because I'm so, I just don't want to go do that thing. And I feel like if I had done that with, if I had done that with the, with the wedding stuff, it would have been, it would have started reflecting in my work. It would have started reflecting my work and it would have started reflecting in the relationships and the experiences that the customers would have had, that the clients would have had. They would have been like, well, he was nice, but he just had a scowl in his face the whole time. And he didn't really like, we got a good video, but he's, it's not a good vibe. And he was kind of a drain on the, you know, I don't want that to be said either. So that was another reason that I had stepped away from it. And then to get back to your original question, she, she, um, my wife knew that 
it was probably the better thing to do because of, you know, how I was when like the minute somebody would put money in my hand and you think, okay, look, and I got this wad of cash in my hand, I should be excited. I was all regretting it. I was like, ah, it's official now. I have to go do this thing because they've paid me and, you know, they've already booked me for that day and they could have booked someone else. And now they're probably not going to get the second person that they thought about because that person's probably already booked. And now I have their money and I don't even want their money and I don't even want this gig. So like starting off like that was already taking an L because I wasn't excited about doing it. I was excited about the idea of not doing my normal job. For me, it's a bit like when people like a person or like being in a relationship, but they more like the idea of being in a relationship opposed to actually being in a relationship and doing all the tasks and the jobs that are required to maintain a healthy relationship. So yeah, you can like the idea of saying, <laughs> can't wait to bounce from this current job I'm doing, but then are you actually going to the, to a place where it's better for you to flourish as an individual or is it something that you're just moving to because you're trying to get away from where you're at? And it could be the same, if not worse, than where you're leaving. Right. I think that's very telling. And, and I appreciate the fact that your wife was very much in tune with you and supportive in that regards. It, it's it's interesting. I think you've covered a quite a few things in there that I that I think, if not for my listeners, at least for myself, where I'm reminiscing and thinking, wow, I really need to be more mindful about how I apply myself to the jobs I do and how I conduct myself. Yes, there might be things I don't enjoy but I need to make sure I deliver 100 for all the right reasons. And one thing I've said, because um, at the moment I work for the government and I deal with people and I've always said for the last few years, I said, even if I don't like my job, it's not the person who I'm going to be seeing is for why I'm in this position. So I shouldn't take it out on them. The best thing I can do is do the best job I can do for them at that time and then let it go. And, you know, that's, that's the sort of mentality I've had. And another part of it I really like is the fact that if you, resent and you you did touch on this where you resented potentially the idea of doing a job it would seep into your work and your attitude and stuff like that and if that's the case I then think gosh what if that person saw my mum and they carried on bad mind because they were vexed about x y and z like don't don't (laughs) don't bring your crap from home into the workplace and impact my mom exactly don't do that so why should I allow that to happen to me like I've had I've gone to work and I've had a blazing headache but you know what that's a me problem that's not a them problem like I will do the best I can it might take me an extra day or two to do it because I can't I'll I'll initiate it but I can't follow through with it and I'll let them know but it's not their fault and I, I think it's important for us to be kind to ourselves but at the same time understand that if we don't like a situation in theory then if we are going to move from it make sure we move into the right place is what I'm hearing from you Right. Absolutely. That's exactly right. Um, Moving into a different space where you're just excited about getting up and doing the thing. This food stuff that I do now, like it's, it's the food stuff that I'm making now. Like I'm excited about that stuff. I'm excited about like checking out a new restaurant and then like, like food blogger, like wedding videographer to food blogger. You know what I mean? Like I'm excited about that. I'm excited about trying different foods. I'm excited about making those videos. I've made more content and more videos and like I'm getting better and better at my workflow on how I'm going to get those videos out. And um, so like, I'm excited about that. And that's exactly. So now that that door closed for making, you know, being a, a wedding videographer, because I just knew that I didn't like doing it. And then now I have this other business that I started where um, I'm going to make food content. And then this company that I started is going to power the Lucky Braxton brand. So like if you take someone like Kevin Hart, Kevin Hart isn't a person. Kevin Hart is a brand. Heartbeat Productions powers that brand. So that's kind of what I'm into now. And I'm actually excited about it. And I'm excited about doing that kind of work and making those kind of videos. And like, that's the feeling that I needed when I was doing the other stuff. I wasn't I'm, like right now, I'm not thinking, I'm thinking about money, but I'm not really thinking about money. I'm thinking about like how would the kind of content that I'm going to make and the kind of people that I'm going to attract with that content and potential clients that I'm going to uh, um, 
attract and doing that now. So like this, the feeling that I have now is the feeling that I wish I had when I started the other project, which I'm glad that I went through it because those are growing pains that we all have to go through as entrepreneurs and content creators. And you know what I mean? Even like there's things that you have to do, even though as much as you love making this podcast, like there's growing pains that you have to go through. Yeah, You know what I mean? There's things that you don't necessarily want to do, but it's not it's not sufficient enough for you to be like, you know what? I'm throwing in the towel. I'm not doing this because like you said before, it is a labor of love and you do have passion for it and you're excited about it and you have all these other things going on in the background. You know what I mean? But at the same time, like you're still excited to see what the potential or what could the possibility that could happen with this podcast. And then the other stuff that you're doing will power this podcast, you know, and the fact that you're not thinking about money and you're just doing it, this is going to be the thing that buys your next house. You know what I mean? Because you're not thinking about that part. You're just thinking about giving the best experience to your listeners. And that's exactly how I feel about with this new company and the new types of videos and type of content that I'm going to start making. So taking that L was almost like failing forward in a sense. Nice. Because that, that was going to be my next question in terms of what it is, but ultimately you've fallen forward or failing forward. I think that is quite in, important. Question for you then. If you was able to go back in time to the peak of when you just felt absolutely rubbish about taking money for a job or, you know, whatever whatever point it was where you just felt like, oh, I'm sick and tired of this. This is putting me in a bad place. What would you tell yourself? I would just tell myself money. I would be, because I was focused on the wrong thing. Like, are you talking about like what I was saying, what I actually was saying to myself then? No, what would you tell yourself going back in time, knowing then what you know now? Oh. What would you have said to your younger self to say, this is not life. This is not your forever. This is just. Right. Okay. So if I was giving myself advice, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you meant no, like, what was I, I doing to I like, get through it? I pose a question badly. That's me. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's all good. So I think that I would go back and then just be like, you know what? You just need to go through it. Just bulldoze through it. Go through it because you're going to feel better once you go through it on the other side. So go through it and not worry about whether or not, because if 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 I didn't go through it, then you, you don't want to be stuck with the what if. What if I did just like go ahead and do it? Would I be the number one? A, a wedding videographer in, in or would I have just closed down the business? So I think if anything, I'd be like, you know what, just go through it. It's growing pains. You have to just bulldoze through it, stay the course, and then just see how you feel. You know what I'm saying? And then that way I would have felt exactly what I feel now. And I'm glad that I did. It was a good decision, even though it was hard. It was a good decision to say, okay, I'm not going to pursue this anymore. I'm just going to cut my losses and not pursue this anymore because there's going to be something else that's going to ignite my passion and ignite my creativity and then figure out a way to flex. So all of those skills that you know I put money into uh, my craft, I put time and I put, you know, I tried to put the 10,000 hours into learning all that stuff. And now I get to apply all of those skills with this new thing. So even so, that's the silver lining is though, even though I was so obsessive about trying to learn all that for money, now I'm, I, ha- I can take that skill set and put it towards something I'm actually you know, excited about. So I would say just go through it, bulldoze through it, go through it, because when you come out the other end of it, you know, you i'm gonna feel better there's there is a silver lining to it that's that's good um i'm i'm gonna do something i haven't done before if you could rattle off a few things that you've learned from that experience what would they be just off the top of your head so just off the top of my head i think that um uh uh what's the word i'm looking for when you're when you just keep moving forward like persistence so if I think I would I would have learned like number one persistence and then the probably even bigger than that is being honest with yourself like honesty like having actual like being vulnerable and and being honest with myself like what are you really doing this for are you doing this for because it makes you happy or are you doing this because you just want to like leave your other job so I would say like figure out what you don't like as quick as possible and then stop doing that thing 
So like, so that's for me dragging it out as long as I could because of the ego and being like, nope, I said I was going to do this and I'm going to hammer home the, um, I'm going to hammer home this, this, this plan. Even if, even if, even if it doesn't work, I'm going to keep, I'm not going to deviate from the plan and I'm going to hammer this plan home and it drug out and drug out and drug out and it made me more miserable. And then on top of that, like my wife was dealing with me being miserable and that's not fun. You know what I'm saying? So I think just that's what I think. I think that the 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 thing that I learned the most was honesty, uh, persistence, and then just like really, really being honest with myself. I think that I, those would be the top things. No, I appreciate that. Um, no, I think you've done a very good job there. So with all that being said, I'm conscious of time. What I'm going to do is let the listeners marinate on this for a while. And prepare themselves for the next episode, which will be your second L. But in the meantime, where can the lovely folks find Lucky Braxton? Everywhere. You go, the main place that I'm focusing right now is is uh, Instagram. That's where I'm the most active. It's definitely on Instagram. But I'm everywhere at Lucky Braxton. It, if you put Lucky Braxton in, it'll either be like Lucky underscore Braxton or Lucky, like right now. But everything is at Lucky Braxton. Much appreciated. Well, thank you very much. Do you want to take this moment and just share a few things about what you got going on? Uh, right now, I got a um, basically my Instagram is a food channel and it's like a food review channel, and that's what that's my next. This is my this is the thing that I'm excited about. Um, going into making this food this food channel, I'm trying to get this this channel to pop off, and then the company that I make that I just made is going to be uh, filming food and restaurants. And trying to make content for the mom and pop shops so that they can take a really cool video, put it against their ads, and then I get that content. And then try to attract bigger brands like Nabisco and Krusty's and stuff like that to make videos for them with those products. That's the idea of what I'm doing. That's what I'm working on right now. And that is what I'm really, really excited about. I oh, wish you all the best with that. And I have no doubt that you'll continue to be a fantastic creative continue to pour your passion into it and the results will just come out pouring so yeah keep doing what you've got to do um to all the listeners thank you very much for the time uh hope you've enjoyed listening to um james's lovely story um i think a lot of us can probably relate to some of the hard hardships that we've gone through doing things that we haven't particularly enjoyed and enjoying it for longer than we should have done because of egos but hopefully if nothing else i know i took from it that through that person having enthusiasm saying why they enjoy doing what they're doing you can hear how eloquent James is when he talks about how passionate he's about his new project because that was a catalyst to help get him to from where he was to where he is now so just remember any kind word you can give to someone else can have this life-changing turnaround in them like in their circumstances so yeah and I think as well, on the flip side, if you have a negative thing to say to someone, it could have the same effect in the reverse. So just be very careful about what you say. But ultimately, you've been listening to the Every L podcast, and it's just proof that not every L is a loss. So saying all that, enjoy yourself. Until next episode, take care of yourself. Every L podcast. Every L podcast.